Last Sunday afternoon, we began a study of New Testament principles, or we may say Bible principles, that support the idea of restoring ancient and pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. In doing that, we started back in the early Old Testament, and we took a trip in pointing out how that it unfolds, that is, the Old Testament and the Bible also, the whole of it, and bringing forth the whole scheme of redemption in showing in Genesis how there is the creation of man and the first sin and the first inkling that there would be salvation brought by God for man, Genesis 3.15. And then we came on down to make a long story a little shorter we see that the messianic race is set up and from them would come eventually the nation of Israel and then from them would come finally where we are today without me going back and repeating a whole sermon from last week and that is that God sent his son John 3 and verse 16 and this was done, as we've said several times lately over the past few weeks, in the fullness of time. At the exact right time in the history of man, Christ came to this world, Galatians 4 and verse 4. And this is where we will simply take up our study from last week and understanding that God presented his plan to save man from sin and to take him into heaven when we get to what is said by God sent forth his son in the fullness of time. Now, as you study through the New Testament, you see that the son came first of all to live, that he might show us how to live. Next of all, he came to die as one who had never sinned, but had been tempted in every point like as we are, that we might be forgiven of our sins. And number three, he came to be raised from the dead for our justification to give us the expectation by faithful Christian living to receive the eternal inheritance in a resurrected body even as our Lord possesses now. And number four, he came to ascend that he might be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. And in so doing, he might reign over his kingdom, which is the church of which you read in the New Testament. So throughout the Old Testament history, God was preparing to send his only begotten son. When you study the Old Testament, while there's so much that pertains to historical matters concerning all those things over a period of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, keep in mind that he is preparing all this time to send his son in the flesh to do what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John declare that he did. But also we see that God gave the church. The church that Jesus promised to build in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, is his church and it's singular. The idea of denominationalism, as it's been around for several hundred years, does not exist anywhere in the Bible. The church of our Lord was involved then in God's, as Paul said to the Ephesians, in God's eternal purpose, Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. It was no afterthought. It was no accident. It was not an adjunct or something like that. It was what he intended to do in his mind before time and material things came into existence. Again, I cite Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. So I've already remarked to that which is common to you that Jesus promised to build his church in Matthew 16, 18. And you'll notice that as you study through here that he gives us the specified time and the place and the circumstances of the establishment of his one church. And again, as I've mentioned already, in Matthew 16, 18 and verse 19, we see that the Lord said his church should be his kingdom. 
The church of our Lord is the kingdom of our Lord. Thus, when he's speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he can speak of being born of water and the Spirit. And then unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So we see that those two terms help us understand better, along with other terms, the very nature of the realm of the saved. Now during his ministry, the Lord taught and he exemplified the principles which would find application when his kingdom or church or the body of Christ was established. And upon his ascension, the Lord sent the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, on that Pentecost in the baptismal measure of the Spirit on the apostles of Christ that they would be able to perform what he called them to do. See, as human beings, they could give their own personal testimony to the Christ and what they saw him do, etc. But then through them, they would be able to deliver anything he said flawlessly and without mistake and that as he said in John 14 15 and 16 the spirit would guide the apostles into all truth and that's how we got our new testament so throughout the old testament history God was actually preparing for the church and so the more you understand about the design and purpose of the information that's communicated to us in the old testament it seems rather ridiculous to say that the church was some sort of mistake or afterthought or something he just threw in because he just happened to think of it. No, the whole Old Testament is saying God is preparing to bring his church into the world. That involved Christ coming because Christ shed his blood to purchase the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. He built his church. He brought it into existence in Acts chapter 2, the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. Thus, Christ made possible a new law. He was born, you'll remember, under the law of Moses. And as a Jew, he lived and died under that law. That was the way that he approached God as a human being, and as did all other Jews, is through the law of Moses. The scripture teaches us that he came to fulfill that law, and he did that for which he came. Uh, keep in mind, fulfill. What is the idea of fulfill? Well, to turn it around and say, feel full. If you've got a glass meant to contain liquid and it's fulfilled, you can't put any more in it because you've filled it full. And thus, it's accomplished what it can do. And in his public ministry, our Lord prepared for the new law, which is. The perfect law of liberty, James 20, 20, 25, the New Testament or the last will and testament of Christ. Now the Lord made specific reference to his New Testament in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. When he talked about uh, instituting the Lord's Supper. This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Also in his death we see that he ended the old law as far as it being the way God would guide and direct anybody on this earth. Romans 7, 1 through 4 compares it to the law of marriage, that a man and a woman are married, but when the man dies, the woman's free because the law doesn't bind anymore to marry whom she will. And so he says that is the same way when it comes to, to the law that we're under today. The law of Moses is not how we approach God today. And you have that said, as I said again this morning, many other times, Paul writing to Colossians, Colossians 2 and verse 14, says that law was nailed to the cross. So he thus made possible the New Testament of Jesus Christ to be the law through which all men, Jew and Gentile, would approach God. Listen to the writer of Hebrews and Hebrews 8. And I mentioned at times you need to go to the book of Hebrews to just see the design and purpose of the law, its duration, and um, the New Testament when it came into effect. In Hebrews 8, starting in verse 8, 
The writer, inspired of the Holy Spirit, said, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now watch the last verse here. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now turn with me to the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 9, and look at beginning with verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also be of necessity the death of the testator. Some of you may very well have your last will and testament written. Well, it's not going to come into effect or have any authority until you're dead and gone from this world. And that's exactly how it's been set out here concerning the testament of Christ. Watch verse 7. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, if you come on down to Hebrews 10 and verse 9, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So God never did intend for the law of Moses to be abiding forever, whereby all men would come to God through the law of Moses. That's the reason we emphasize, as we have done on Sunday morning in the class on the first principle of studying the Bible, <clears throat> what he said in Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 5. And Moses said, This law was given to us, not to our fathers, but us, who are all of us alive here this day. Making it clear the law of Moses was for the Jews. No Jew was ever taught to go out and teach all the other people who weren't Jews the law of Moses. Proselytes could choose to come in and live like the law of Moses, but never was the law to be preached to every creature as the gospel is to be preached by the church to every people, all people in every generation. In chapter 9 also in verse 15, Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. So obviously then he intended for this particular covenant to be available to all men. And so, verse 15, earlier in chapter 9, and for this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, these are some of the scriptures I referred to on Sunday mornings. The reason I said I won't do this on Sunday afternoon now on these restoration principles, because they dovetail together, <clears throat> and this should help us there. Now, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are intended to set forth incontestable fact, the incontestable fact, I say, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that as such, He is then in the position to have all authority which the first person of the Godhead, His Father, gave Him. Remember, He said in Matthew 28, 18, that all power or authority hath been given unto me. Somebody had to do the giving. He was the receiver. Well, it was the Father in whom all authority inheres, and he delivered this authority to his Son. He doesn't have just some of it. Jesus said, I've been given all authority. So he's the one who has the authority to deal with the problem of human sins. Think about it for a moment. 
as he existed in the form of God, there's no way he could be tempted with evil. The Bible comes plainly out and says that. James does. God in the form of God cannot be tempted with evil. But Jesus was tempted with evil. But when, did, when was Jesus tempted to do evil? After he became a man as much as you are or I am. Thus Satan had access to him that he did not have when he was still in the form of deity in heaven before he became a man. So Christ overcame Satan as a man, as you are and I am, as a human being. Overcame him in his own realm. So he affirmed that all authority, because he was able to do that, had been given unto him, Matthew 28 and verse 18. Repeatedly, therefore, in the New Testament, we find stressed our responsibility to make sure we hear and understand what he has to say. I would ask you sometime in your reading of the scriptures, just a note, how many places, in one way or the other, it tells us you have a responsibility to hear Christ, to understand his will, to know his will, to make sure you're abiding in his will. The, by the way, also, the, the book of Hebrews does that time and time again as it shows the place of the law of Moses and the place of the New Testament. It'll tell you to hear him. So throughout Old Testament history, God was preparing for this New Testament. So God, and of course, and his son, made possible the gospel message. And this gospel message is the glad tidings, the good news, the good message, the message which produces joy and happiness and gladness in human hearts, such as when the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized. He went on his way rejoicing. He was reconciled to God. He was forgiven of his sins. He was justified in God's sight. God was on his side and he was on God's side by his humble obedience to the truth. And he had the wherewithal then to overcome Satan. So this good message, this gospel message, God's power to save us, Romans 1.16, that gospel that's to be preached to every creature, Mark 16.15, relates to, first of all, the possibility and the means of actual forgiveness of sins. Then the second place Spiritual blessings are to be had in one place, one place only, in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. And then number three, the great and marvelous and blessed hope of eternal life, Romans eight twenty four. Now, not long before our Lord ascended to heaven, you know that he gave what we know as the Great Commission, that the gospel account was to be preached to every creature in the whole world. As I say, this is why it's called the Great Commission. And that's recorded in two main places we're familiar with, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Mark 16, 15 and 16. Now, what we might very well say is, is that the Great Commission is the constitution of the kingdom of Christ. Apostolic teaching is simply the amplification of this commission. Apostolic practice is the exemplification of this commission. Remember, the apostles were chosen by the Lord to be his ambassadors from the court of heaven to earth, that by the Holy Spirit they would reveal the mind of Christ completely and totally, be able to have perfect recall, flawless recall of what he said and he was here. And thus we have within them apostolic direction. And though the apostles were all dead, they are still yet alive. How so? Their teaching is still here. I can continue and must in the apostles' doctrine today, even as people did when they walked this earth. I have it all in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So apostolic history summarizes God's plan. 
may we emphasize it is a divine plan, a sacred plan, one that did not originate with man. So as charged, the apostles, as well as others, preached the Christ. They preached his life. They preached his death. They preached his burial. They preached his resurrection. They preached his ascension, and they preached his coronation, and they preached he's coming again, not to set foot on this earth, but coming in the clouds at the end of time to bring all men into judgment at the resurrection of the dead, the just and the unjust. Did you read your New Testament? You see that they preached his church and his gospel message. They did not deviate from it. As Paul said to the Ephesian elders, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole or all the counsel of God. They weren't content, therefore, to preach part of it or most of it, but all of it. And we should not be happy with just part of it or some of it, but all of it. This preaching was designed to produce faith, confidence, and trust in God and Christ. But more than that, the whole New Testament system. We do well to ask ourselves sometimes, how much faith do I have in the direction of God as it's set out in the words of the New Testament? This faith will produce repentance. Repentance is a turning from the wrong way, the sinful way, our, sin, our sins, to God and His way in obedience to the truth. Thus, He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Then saving faith compelled confession of one's faith in the Christ. That's part of it. It's no secret thing about it. You to stand before men and confess that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Romans 10, 10, Matthew 10, 32. Saving faith compelled them to obey Christ and all he said. And he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not belief alone. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. Belief minus baptism simply means a dead faith that James talks about in James chapter 2. It's the faith of devils. Faith without belief and obedience to Christ, or I should say simply without obedience to Christ, is a dead faith. It won't save anybody. So saving faith compel baptism in the name or by the authority of Christ and to obtain or for the remission of forgiveness of sins. Baptism put that kind of person into Christ. There is no other doorway into Christ where all spiritual blessings in heavenly places have been located, Ephesians 1, 3. In other words, into his body, the spiritual body of Christ, his church, his kingdom. Paul makes that clear in Romans 6, 3 and 4, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Now, when you read your New Testament, you'll see those who are in Christ are variously designated. And the New Testament church was also variously designated. The New Testament churches were, first of all, organized according to the divine pattern. Number two, they worshiped according to the divine standard. And number three, they were governed by the divine will. And number four, they worked to accomplish the divine mission which is the salvation of the souls of men. Remember, it's unto them is committed the gospel to be preached to every creature. So this is the sacred plan that is being prepared for in the Old Testament times or history. And clearly, it's revealed on the pages of the New Testament. Now, of course, you see I'm going very lightly over this. Much of it depends upon how much you already know, but it's trying to show the system as it's revealed. The tremendous time and multitudinous details that were involved in the preparation for it and the presentation of it emphasizes the importance of it. Think for a moment. It took hundreds and hundreds of years as God worked with man down through the stream of time from the very beginning for everything to be put together in detail to make it just the right time and right place for Christ to come into this world. 
That also means it's the same thing concerning the church that he purchased with his blood. It was the time for that to happen too. So this is not just a plan some bunch of men got together and put together. It's a divine plan. It's the only plan. And it's the only one that Christians, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, are to believe and are to preach and to stand up for. It cannot be disregarded with impunity. The plan is the gospel, the truth, the faith for which we are to contend, Jude 3, and the sound doctrine, the wholesome teaching. And this plan was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3, American Standard Version. Well, that puts it here, but in time, men departed from that divine plan. They turned away from it by simply loving something else more. They, some people want to say, well, they never were Christians in the first place. That's not what your Bible says. When you read 1 Timothy 4, you're hearing Paul tell Timothy about people who departed from the faith. You can't be a part of it to depart from it. In other words, you have to be a part of it in order to leave it. You're in this building now. You're going to leave it later, the Lord willing. Now, you can't leave what you're not in. And so it is when it comes to men departing from the sacred plan of the gospel system that's so clearly revealed on the pages of the New Testament. I think it's good to remind us that while the Lord was here on earth in his earthly ministry that he spoke of the narrowness of the way, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Well, all he's doing is saying that's the nature of truth. To hear some people talk about truth today, you think it just is as broad as anybody wants it to be. And so you hear people talking about my truth and your truth and truth is relative and truth is subjective and that's just how you view it. And nothing is really objective and absolute. But it wouldn't be straight and narrow if it wasn't objective and absolute. But it is straight and narrow. And I think it's interesting that when you look at the hard sciences, physics, chemistry, and such like, you won't find deviations there because those laws have to be followed exactly. And you know the same mathematical laws that got us to the moon in 1969, even though computers have changed tremendously since then, are still the same mathematical laws that get you there today. Even though it can be spun out a lot faster <laughs> through a computer maybe than it was then, it's still the same thing. They haven't changed. And so it is a spiritual law. When God has delivered it, there it is. That's why Jesus could say, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. It's not going to change. So even in apostolic days, there was evidence that men would depart and that some were departing from the divine plan. And I've already referred you to 1 Timothy 4, 1, where Paul told Timothy, the Spirit speaks expressly that in a latter time some shall depart from the faith. They do so by giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. Paul also said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after each years will heap to themselves teachers after their own lust. So there's the problem. Their own lust. And will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside into fables. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Notice the will to turn to or the will to turn away. It's there in all of us. You know one thing we should learn to be scared of is our own free, free will. Because we can will to reject the truth. We can will to believe a lie as it suits us. We have that power. God will not force himself upon us against our will. So Paul referred to the falling away and stated even in while he was alive in writing part of the New Testament that the mystery of lawlessness doth already work. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 7. In Acts 28 or 20 and verse 28 beginning all the way through verse 30, the apostle Paul issues a very significant warning. And he was speaking to those shepherds, those elders, those presbyters of the church in the city of Ephesus. He referred to dangers without and dangers within. 
he referred specifically to corruption in the very leadership in the eldership. So there was departure in organization. Each New Testament church was independent. That is, each congregation of God's people is separate from every other. Each one runs its own affairs under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. So when fully organized according to the divine pattern, they had a plurality of men responsible for superintending or overseeing the congregation. Now with reference to these men, the Greek New Testament gives us these three terms. In the English translation, it turns out to be six terms. They're called in English bishop, overseers, elders, presbyters, pastors, and shepherds. All we need to be concerned about is the very significance of the three original words that the Holy Spirit had those men write. And it should be emphasized that these three words apply to the same group of men. Acts 20, 17, 28, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And by the way, we'll be able in our study of Peter, the Lord willing on Wednesday night, to get into that more. Therefore, there was no difference in the matter of authority among those men. However, early in religious history, men began to do what men like to do, assume. Assume that there was more authority inherent in the term episkopos than there was the term presbyteros. And men began to talk about the bishop. The bishop. But never do you find in the New Testament the bishop. You find a plurality of elders or bishops or presbyters over each congregation when they're fully and scripturally organized. Well, in time, there were numerous other departures. It took several hundred years and we may say unauthorized practices for that's what we mean when we say departures. And beginning in approximately 100 A.D., and that's not more than about probably 25 years or so, and less than that since John died, that Paul walked the earth, if he died around 64, 65. So there was um, at least 30 years. There was a gradual development of what's called sacerdotalism. That's the belief in a dividedly authorized special priesthood. Priesthood. But the Bible teaches that every member of the church is a priest because the church is also known as God's temple, a place of worship. And by the middle of the second century, there were provincial church councils. By the middle of the second century, there were human creeds being written. By the middle of the third century, there were numerous officers and offices that are foreign to the teaching of the New Testament. And from the second century on, there's just an abundance of every kind of ritualism and paganism mixed up with the, the doctrine of Christ, compromises and all kinds of celebration of certain days. And from 100 A.D. to about 1500, there were multitudinous doctrinal changes and additions. And thus... Roman Catholicism was in control from the 6th to the 16th centuries. I want to make something clear here because our brethren sometimes, I think, have failed to understand. And we fall right into the hands of Roman Catholics when we do it. We'll talk about the Roman Catholic Church as the apostate church. No church can be apostate unless, first of all, it was the real thing. And you leave the real thing and you apostatize. The Roman Catholic Church never was the real thing. It formed out of the apostate church. The church had already fallen away. Roman Catholicism did not begin to take form to 700 years after the first century, and it formed out of the church that had fallen away. So it's really the first big worldwide denomination, and out of it came all the Protestant denominations beginning in the 1500s. Remember, the word Protestant means to protest. 
So there were a lot of folks in the 1500s, such as Luther and others, who protested what they saw corruptions in the Catholic Church. But it wasn't an apostate church. It was a church that had no authority to exist and formed out of the apostate church. Well, my time's about gone today, and next week, the Lord willing, we'll look at uh, the efforts of men to return to the divine plan. But I want to encourage you to flesh out what we basically are giving as an outline of these things, just a summary of what all happened. To do that, you're going to have to look at some church history books. We have all of the post-Nicene, they're called fathers, and anti-Nicene fathers. That's the way they refer to them. We have all of those even in the library. Sometimes pretty dull reading. But nevertheless, you can see where all this stuff started. They say anti-Nicene and post-Nicene because the Nicene Council, council called by Constantine, in about 325, poses as what all went on after that and what all went on before that, and that's the way they mark it. So we have a lot of that writing going on. And you see all kinds of departures and whatever. And if you want to see it further, you can get some good church history books and read them. But don't expect to find what you find in your New Testament. Now, they were still holding on to a great many things, especially many moral matters they taught. But when it came to what the church is and its plan of salvation, its organization, its work, its worship, and all that kind of thing, great departures took place in the first two, three hundred years, beginning even in the late first century, not long after inspiration ceased. But we study now even today what to do to become a Christian. If anybody needs to and honestly wants to, then you can do that by obeying the Gospels. We studied it during this sermon and studied it many other times. Or as a child of God, if you sin, then you can think seriously about that and turn from that sin and repentance and ask God for forgiveness. So we have an invitation song song of encouragement to anyone that wants to do that to encourage you to act upon what needs to be done to make your life right with God and we urge you to do that now while together we stand and sing.